Beatrice. Symbols of Love Series, Book 4. Written by Leah Connolly and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website and on Amazon. Save more with our bundles. Enjoy. Chapter 1. Gregory Hilmott had always been told that rearing girls was a far easier endeavour than bringing up boys. It was an idiom repeated so often that it was accepted as nearly universal truth in society, and Gregory himself believed it. When he had found himself the father of three young girls in short order, his mind had been full of all the joys of the feminine sort. Hair in ribbons, delicate little voices learning to sing along to the pianoforte, all smiles and shiguri sweetness. After all, girls were so much easier to keep in hand than boys. As the girls grew, Gregory found himself very much of the opinion that the person who first propagated that particular lie should be soundly whipped. He was a man with an ordered mind and a sense of strict discipline, relishing in order and regimental structure. As a colonel serving in His Majesty's army, Gregory had been quite at home in such a straight-lined setting. His wife had been serene, a lily, soft woman, who took everything in stride, where he had been all harsh angles and unyielding reason. Mrs. Hilmot was delicate, nudging things into place with a gentle word or touch of her pale hand. They were a happy union of complete opposites who complemented each other in the best possible way. The happy life that they had built for each other came crashing down in an instant. Mrs. Hilmot, his beloved Jane, had sickened after the birth of their last daughter and had never really recovered. She appeared to simply fade away, her skin becoming paler, her whole existence more gossamer. Then, one day, she was gone, leaving Gregory with three young girls and not a clue as to how to carry on. A loud crash interrupted Gregory's reverie. He had not even been aware that he had slipped away into the past. It simply came over him as easily as falling asleep, as he stared out the window to the rolling hills beyond. He had been contemplating the merits of riding out and then suddenly had been years away again. Thin voices followed the crash, arguing in louder and louder pitches, the words indistinguishable. A fourth voice joined in, pleading and cajoling, weary to the point of breaking. Gregory remained where he was, insulated from the worst of it in his small library. He automatically stood at attention, back rigid and hands folded behind his back as he stared out of the window, distant from the cacophony of the rest of the house. Another thud sounded from somewhere in the hall, accompanied shortly after by a stampede of feet. From just outside the library, Gregory could hear the poor, put-upon governess pleading for order and quiet. Please, girls, your father is trying to... No, Sophia, don't pull Eliza's braid so. Florence, that is hardly behaviour becoming of a lady. Really, where did you even learn that gesture? No, I do not wish to see it again. Girls, really! Sighing, Gregory turned on the heel of one impeccably polished boot and made for the library door. He reached it just as something fell against it bodily, flavoured with the squeals of girls in the throes of a heated argument. Stealing himself, he pulled the heavy wooden door open suddenly and in tumbled a pile of pinafores and ribbons, knees and elbows flying in every direction. He could only stare for a moment. The governess was behind them, her starched white cap askew, her hair escaping its moorings as she frantically tried to wade into the melee and sought out the colonel's daughters. His daughters, meanwhile, were all engaged in some form of wrestling, each one locked onto the other by either limb or braid. As they tussled, they all squealed at each other to either let go or insisting that they had ruined it, whatever it was. It was only when the pile of adorable miscreants had collided with Gregory's highly polished boots that they seemed aware of their surroundings. There was a lull in the chaos, and Gregory immediately took advantage of their momentary surprise. Desist! He barked in a tone and volume he normally resolved for disobedient new recruits to his regiment. 
Immediately silence descended as the girls froze. The governess, too, became as still as a statue, her eyes wide. Sophia, the youngest, blinked up at her father, her head resting against his boots. Her face broke into a smile, her cheeks dimpling adorably. Hello, Papa! She chirped into the silence as if nothing were amiss. Gregory stared down, sighed again, and then bent to begin pulling his daughters off each other. When they were all righted and assembled in a line from youngest to oldest, he resumed his military officer's posture. He stared down his nose at each of them until they individually dropped their heads, shuffling nervously. Now, before I hand out your due punishments for running roughshod all over your governess and behaving like a pack of wild dogs, have any of you anything to say for yourselves? Florence? Gregory stood before his eldest daughter who refused to meet his eyes, her jaw stubbornly tight. Eliza? The middle daughter, all awkward growth as she left childhood, studied her toes, then shook her head. That left Sophia, the youngest and sometime baby of the family. Gregory had a difficult time with this one, as she most favoured his late wife with big brown eyes that always seemed ready to smile. Sophia? We were preparing a surprise for you, she blurted, much to the irritation of her sisters, which manifested in matching sighs and eye rolls. Sophia! Florence snapped, glaring down the line to the youngest. Florence, Gregory warned. Eliza started it, Sophia interjected. Sophia! Now it was Eliza's turn to bark at the youngest, who responded by letting her mouth fall into an unconvincing pout. Enough! Gregory barked, feeling that they were precariously close to descending into another route. Wearily, he pinched the bridge of his nose between thumb and forefinger of his right hand. And what was this surprise, then? Demonstrating your ability to act like a gang of common ruffians, he demanded, turning a withering look up on all of them. We were going to put on a performance for you, Sophia supplied. We thought you might like some amusement to cheer you. Gregory let this sink in for a moment. He had no notion on how to reply to this revelation, having very little experience with young ladies. He was not sure that it was entirely proper, and it was certainly unlikely to offer any kind of real intellectual benefit to the girls. He glanced to the governess, who was busy trying to write her cap and apron. We've worked very hard on it, Eliza said into the silence, quietly but earnestly. We wanted it to be like the theatre. Especially since some of us are not permitted to go, Florence added spikily. Gregory shot her a warning glance, and she folded her arms and looked off defiantly. With Florence busy staring off into the middle distance with a petulant set to her chin, and Eliza studying the rug beneath her feet, it was down to Sophia to supply all the hopeful and pleading looks. To Gregory's discomfort, his youngest daughter seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of these. She stared up like a fawn at Gregory, blinking her large brown eyes slowly. A formative point of his military training was to know when, against all odds and reason, he was defeated. Gregory had not risen to the rank of colonel by being foolhardy. Therefore, it was with a heavy sigh that he offered his daughters his hands. Very well, he said grudgingly. It seems only right to see this performance that has caused so much furore in our house, Perhaps this will be a good time to see what you have learned from your governess, he added with a cool look to said governess, who paled a little. All previous conflict forgotten, his daughters surrounded him, taking him by the hands and pulling him along toward the sitting room. They chatted the whole way there, which Gregory found impossible to actually follow. Resigned to his fate, Gregory took his appointed seat noting that the rest of the furniture had been moved aside, save his own chair and one ostensibly for the governess. The sitting room, not large to begin with, was cut in half by a series of blankets and other bedclothes thrown over a line strung across the room. The girls disappeared behind this improvised curtain, whispers and not-so-whispered jabs, and whinging leaking out occasionally. There was a distinct sound of scurrying, and then it was silent for a moment. 
The governess, casting sidelong looks at Gregory, took her seat uneasily. The tension radiating from her was practically palpable, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. Gregory said nothing to her, folding his right leg over the other. With some effort, one section of the homemade curtain was yanked aside, and little Sophia was thrust forward. She had painted cheeks and a little pink bow of a mouth, and on her head was a wilting flower crown that seemed to be held together mostly out of will. The rouged cheeks caused Gregory to stiffen. He glanced to the governess, who was busy patting her forehead with a small handkerchief. We would like to present the story of the fox and the maid, as written by the... Sophia hesitated, her little brow furrowing as she struggled for words. The illustrated... Illustrious! A voice hissed from behind the curtain. Ill... Luster's Eliza Hilmot, Sophia concluded, adding a little bow. Obligingly, Gregory and the governess rewarded this little speech with a smattering of applause. Taking this as encouragement, Sophia took it upon herself to keep up a litany of bows, much to the growing irritation of the other two behind the curtain. Move, Sophia, one of them said, not even bothering to whisper any more. We cannot go on if you do not get yourself off the stage. But they keep applauding, Sophia protested. As if to prove her point, she bowed again. The improvised curtain began to undulate then, as if hands were seeking purchase behind it at a frantic pace. One of the girls from backstage, such as it was, found the split in the curtain before which Sophia was standing and thrust her hand forward. This disembodied hand flailed about for a moment, the fingers curled into determined little claws. At last, it clutched the back of Sophia's dress and yanked her backward forcefully. Therein followed a great deal of squealing, the unmistakable sounds of scuffling, all the while punctuated with half-yelled accusations of one or the other ruining the whole proceeding. The curtain was once again an ocean unto itself, as it flapped and writhed from the chaos it was valiantly attempting to conceal. Girls, please, the governess tried, her voice tired and tentative. She half rose from her chair, clearly unsure of what she ought to do. Gregory, firmly believing that a person's true metal was revealed in times of crisis, kept his seat, waiting to see what she would do. The governess' half-hearted attempts at restoring order were roundly ignored. As a result, the commotion from behind the curtain continued to crescendo. There was the sound of something breaking, and at last the much-abused curtain gave up its hold on the line it had been hung on. Sophia was caught under it, while the older two had hold of each other by the arms and hair, hurling accusations as to who was at fault the entire time. The governess, at a loss for words, sat heavily back down in her chair and buried her face in her apron for a moment. Gregory, recognising a rout when he saw it, knew that there was no hope of her restoring order. He stood preparing to wade into the fray. The governess, sensing movement, looked up from her apron, her face tired. I am dismissed, aren't I? She asked bleakly. Very, Gregory agreed. He turned away, ready to begin seizing disorderly daughters and pry them apart. From behind him, there was a barely audible, oh, thank heavens. Chapter 2 For someone that had been born into a life devoid of fineries, Beatrice Hart had become quite a dab hand at spotting true quality in everything, from silks to horses to men. Of course, her estimation of quality could be best described as that which was the loveliest, most expensive, or the rarest, in no particular order. She had a real eye for jewels in particular, their sparkle and shine making her eyes gleam. It was not simply her tastes that were incongruous with her origins. Beatrice had been born the daughter of poor labourers in a poor labouring village that she had little memories of, only clearly remembering that it was cold and damp. Despite her humble origins, she accepted any and all tribute as her due, 
as a queen, might condescend to accept gifts from her vassals. Tonight was no exception. She had concluded her performance for the evening and retired to her dressing room. As was her due, she had laid claim to the largest and best dressing room, arranging to have a plush velvet chaise lounge installed against one wall. It was here that she would lounge in a silk banyan, awaiting her well-wishers and callers, offering occasional glimpses of her wrists or ankles in payment. There were the usual posies and bouquets, which she always accepted first. Willing stagehands ferried them into her dressing room, pleased at being admitted to the inner sanctum. In this way, she was surrounded by a garden of bounty and delicate floral scent before anyone even laid eyes on her. She fancied herself a master of the tableau vivante, imagining that she arranged herself like a lush painting. Her dresser, a maid that had by all accounts been at the theatre since the time of Noah's childhood, stood close at hand, ready to receive cards and announce callers. At a nod from Beatrice, she opened the door, accepting the cards being thrust at her. Mr. Alexander Featherwright, the dresser croaked. After a moment's consideration, Beatrice nodded her assent. Mr. Featherwright was a floppy sort of young man with blonde curls that fell across his forehead in a boyishly charming manner. He was always happy to see Beatrice gazing at her with a kind of awe-inspired adoration, which suited her just fine. As per the norm when he spotted Beatrice, he fell to one knee before her, looking at her hopefully. Good evening, Mr. Featherwright. She purred imperiously offering her hand to him, which he gladly accepted. Miss Hart, if you are not the most gifted woman in the whole kingdom, I shall turn right around and become a monk, he breathed, all earnest flattery. Beatrice couldn't help but smile at him. You are a darling thing, aren't you? She cooed, placing her other hand in his. From the way his entire mien lightened, it was clear that this was the highlight of the week as far as he was concerned. I've brought you a gift, Mr. Featherwright said with a slight blush, adorably bashful. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a small velvet box, which he offered up shyly to Beatrice. She took it readily, murmuring her thanks to him. Without hesitating, she released the catch on the box, popping it open. Nestled within on the satin lining was a thin, gold bangle with three little rubies set into the top of it. Beatrice's eyes widened and she lifted it from the box, holding it up so that the gems could catch the light. I, I remember you saying that rubies were a particular favourite of yours, Mr. Featherite offered. Indeed, they are, Beatrice murmured, bringing the bauble closer to her eye. And these are truly remarkable ones, such colour and clarity. Why, Miss Hart, perhaps you would have been a jeweller or gem appraiser in a different life, Mr. Featherwright said, smiling at her delight. No, she said with a cheeky smile, folding her fingers around the bracelet and tucking it closer to herself. I think I'd make for a better jewel thief. In one fluid, mercurial movement, she rose to her feet, treating the befuddled Mr. Featherwright to a quick glimpse of her ankles as she did so. Can't you imagine me pillaging my way through the continent's palaces and cathedrals? She punctuated this with a little twirl, one leg behind the other. I can. Mr. Featherwright breathed without a trace of irony. He cleared his throat then, straightening his jet black jacket and crisp white cravat as if he had just remembered why he had come in the first place. Miss Hart, if it is not too much of an imposition, might I request the pleasure of your company tonight? I've my carriage, and I thought you might fancy a grand dinner after... Beerus turned back to Mr. Featherwright, already weighing the merits of his invitation. However, the dresser, still at her post next to the door, was busy attempting to catch Beatrice's eye. The dresser tilted her head, nodding significantly toward the door. Beatrice quirked one eyebrow questioningly, and the dresser inclined her head again. This silent exchange of gestures was carried on over Mr. Featherwright's head as he was still perched upon one knee on the floor of Beatrice's dressing room. Though not a word had been spoken, 
Beatrice clearly understood the meaning. There was a far greater catch awaiting her just outside. Quickly, Beatrice bent and hauled Mr. Featherite upright with surprising strength. Before he now knew what was happening, he was being ushered to the door again. What a charmer you are, Mr. Featherite, Beatrice said, laying her other hand on his elbow. But I could not possibly accept your invitation in the state I am in now. You couldn't? He protested weakly. Oh, certainly not. Why, I am positively done in from my efforts on the stage tonight, Beatrice continued, resting her cheek on his shoulder for a moment. She gazed up at him, fluttering her eyelashes, in the most beseeching manner that she knew how. It would be positively bad of me to be less than radiant for you. Oh, Miss Hart, you could never... Mr. Featherite attempted to protest. Of course you understand. You are such a darling boy, she cooed, somewhat underscoring her flattering words by pushing him out the door with a surprising amount of force. She allowed herself a moment to regain her composure. Retaking her seat upon the lounge, she attempted an air of casualness. Her posture relaxed. It was imperative to Beatrice that she not appear as if she were truly waiting to receive callers. Rather, they simply happened upon her, and she would let them pay their calls by chance. After suitably arranging her banyan again, she gave the nod to her dresser. In somewhat elevated tones, the dresser read the name on the next card. His Honour, Judge Derek Horner, the dresser proclaimed loud enough for everyone waiting in the hall to hear. This set off a round of murmurs, which was quickly cut off when the door was shut behind this new, more illustrious caller. He entered the room grandly, surveying it with cool, grey eyes as if he owned everything within. He was dressed fashionably, with a double-breasted coat and a pinked collar so high that it brushed along his sharp jaw. His breeches were dove grey, and he wore them tucked into polished leather boots in deference to the questionable spring weather. Why, what an unexpected delight this is, Beatrice murmured, sitting up and smiling coyly at the judge. I'm delighted you think so, he replied, his eyes lighting upon Beatrice. He came forward to accept her offered hand, but it was done with an air of bemusement. I hope that I am not keeping you from some other delights this evening. Beatrice gave a casual little flip of her hand. I am sure that I can be spared for one evening. Hmm, the judge agreed, staring down his long sharp nose at Beatrice. Would you care to accompany me to Vauxhall this evening? I've heard there is a new display of fireworks that's being readied. Is there? Well, I suppose one must spend the evening doing something, Beatrice sighed, not wishing to appear overeager. Casually, she stood and went to sit at her dressing table, fussing at her reflection. The judge watched this with interest, his nostrils flaring a little. Very good. My carriage awaits you then, dear lady, he said, bowing over Beatrice's hand and daring to press a kiss to her knuckles. Beatrice maintained her cool, distant composure. I shall be with you shortly, she said. He withdrew and Beatrice sat for a moment butterflies in her stomach. The judge was always an interesting evening, though a challenging one. He was a powerful man, and he was quite aware of it. Still, he was never boring, and he had more money than Croesus. It was largely thanks to him that Beatrice was able to maintain a large and spacious flat near the park, a luxury reserved almost exclusively for the wealthy and titled. He was the distant heir to a title, and had a nobleman's taste for collecting beautiful things. Beatrice was happy to be collected. For now. She began to attend to her toilette, wiping away the stage makeup and removing the heavy wig with relief. With sharp fingernails, she scratched at her itchy scalp, fingers digging into the hair that she kept cropped daringly short. She turned her head this way and that, admiring the turn of her neck and trying to ascertain the better angles of her face. Candlelight was exceptionally flattering, and here, among the gifts and flowers piled high, it was easy for Beatrice to feel secure, a little smug even. She felt entitled to a little vanity, 
as it had been necessary for her to scramble and claw her way to her current position. She admired her bottle green eyes, the cat-like way they tilted up in the corners. Her face, not quite as full as fashion dictated these days, was still comely by nearly any measure, if a little sharply boned. Lifting her porcelain pot of face cream, she worked it carefully, deliberately, into her face and neck. Though her talent put the great and good of London into the theatre seats, it was her looks that guaranteed a steady supply of male companionship. It was only through their largesse that she was able to live as she did. It was imperative that she do everything in her power to preserve her face for as long as possible. Her hands paused for a moment mid-swipe on her cheekbones. Sometimes, when she was quite alone with her thoughts and staring into the mirror, a little tickle of fear would run through her. Beatrice knew that this life she led would not last forever, and it was at these moments that a creeping fear for the future would snap at her heels. Aggressively, Beatrice shook her head. She dipped her fingers into the face cream again, scented with lavender and orange blossom, and vigorously rubbed it into her jaws. Be gone, she muttered aloud to her doubts. She could not afford to be distracted tonight. The judge would smell the insecurity on her like blood in the water, and he would pounce without hesitation. Yours is a strange lot, some unbidden part of her mind whispered. Lonely, but never alone. Vulnerable, but untouchable. Quickly, she crammed these thoughts down as well, burying them beneath layers of silk and lace. She dressed quickly in a dark gold silk gown with wine-red velvet ribbon about the hem in stripes, her dresser helping her to button the back. She selected matching red gloves, her favourite colour. As she slipped her feet into dark red silk pumps, she allowed herself one last admiring, almost defiant look in the large floor-length mirror in the corner of her dressing room. Beatrice lifted her chin proudly, her lips curling a little. She had an evening of fine dining, the best champagne, and all the other delights that Vauxhall had to offer to look forward to, and she looked every inch the part. Who has time for loneliness when one's plate is so full of amusements? She asked herself as she left her dressing room, a fur-trimmed capulet about her shoulders. Perhaps a bit more forcefully than necessary, Beatrice slammed the door on her dressing room and that thought. Chapter 3 The pleasure gardens at Vauxhall were a sight to behold on any given night, but with the promise of spring just around the corner, they were heavy with anticipation. There were amusements of every kind, from dancing to pantomimes to a hot air balloon that would take guests up for a bird's eye view of London. Of course, the main point was to see and be seen, and the fashionable people of the ton were out in force as soon as the weather permitted. Beatrice, ever a performer, was quite happy to be seen and admired on the arm of Judge Horner. His position was not the highest in the land, but he had built himself grand holdings and dined with some of the highest-ranking families. It was also no secret that he was in line for a title from an ailing and distant uncle. They perambulated slowly, with nearly everyone they passed stopping to stare as they walked by. Beatrice, with her dancer's ability, managed to walk in such a way that it was less a mode of transportation and more a graceful undulation. Judge Horner, straight-backed and in a tall black hat, cut an imposing figure next to her. Several people approached him, but he did not hesitate to stare down, those that he felt were not up to snuff. Thus, only those with something to offer, be it money, position or title, were permitted in his presence. They had dined well, and the judge had seen to it that Beatrice was never without a glass of champagne, decorated with candied violets floating on the top. Beatrice did not drink deeply, but she enjoyed the way the bubbles tickled her tongue as she sipped. They paused, watching a troop of acrobats that had been shipped in from India. They wore bells on their ankles, so that every athletic feat they performed was accompanied by jaunty jingling. A skill 
that is beyond even you, I think, Judge Horner said at last, ducking his head closer to Beatrice's. She nodded absently, watching the performance intently. Fascinated, she could not take her eyes from their hands and feet, arched into unfamiliar shapes. She tilted her head, the feathers on her silk bonnet arching over her ear as she did so. There was a slight tugging on her arm, and she was brought back to herself. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. Thank you again. Now back to our story. The judge was staring down at her with all the warmth of a marble statue. Beatrice blinked up at him, aware that he had likely been saying something. He was not the sort of man who liked being ignored. That was the whole reason for his chasing after a woman like Beatrice. I'm sure you're right, she said at last, smiling one of her coy little smiles up at him. Perhaps you might like to see the maze, he offered, glancing about. It is bound to at least be quieter. We might then hear each other speak. Beatrice glanced toward the lower half of the gardens, where an impromptu hedge maze was being cultivated. It was not yet complete, the hedges still being pruned into shape. There were no lights to speak of, just the overflowing glow from the gardens proper. She bit her lip, considering. It would leave them both open to rumour, but if she were being honest, she was already a somewhat infamous woman in London. She glanced up to the judge and found him still impassively staring down at her. If nothing else, it will keep the more impudent of the prying eyes away, he said with a significant sweep of his eyes to their surroundings. Bearish too, looked about, and found that they had become something of a side attraction themselves. The ton were all staring at them, some whispering behind gloved hands and fans. Beatrice did not mind that, was rather used to it, in fact, but she was rather perturbed that it was detracting attention away from the splendid performance in front of them. As a performer herself, she was incensed. Let us adjourn then, your honour, Beatrice sniffed, putting her nose into the air and her free hand atop the judge's elbow. Gratified, Judge Horner led the two of them into the maze. The moment that they turned the first corner, the sounds from the wider gardens was considerably dulled. Though the hedges were not completed yet, they still had something of an insulating effect, making Beatrice feel as if she had stepped through a doorway into a different world. Unconsciously, she seized tighter onto the judge's elbow. He chuckled a little, but it was not a sound of amusement. Beatrice had the distinct impression that he was having a laugh at her expense, and she immediately loosed her grip in spite of her misgivings. Nevertheless, she refused to let him see that she was uncertain, and she sallied forth as if she knew precisely where she was going. The path, however, being gravel, was proving rather more of a challenge than she had expected, she had only gone a few paces when a pebble became lodged in her shoe, causing her to wince. Windmilling a little with one arm, she sought purchase on the hedge as she attempted to balance on one foot. Is something the matter? the judge asked, looming uncomfortably close to Beatrice. No, it's nothing to be concerned over, Beatrice said with a casual wave of one hand. Simply a stone in my shoe. If I had known the terrain would be so questionable tonight, I'd have worn my walking boots. Ah, uh, but then you would have deprived me of the chance to come to your rescue, the judge said, taking her hand and kneeling in the gravel. Though he spoke chivalrously, there was something malignant in his face as he knelt before Beatrice. Her heart was fluttering wildly in her chest, and she had the strangest impulse to simply take off and run, she tamped down the urge, covering her unease with a smile. The judge, meanwhile, had released Beatrice's hand and taken her foot into both of his hands. Sliding her shoe off, he made a casual effort at shaking out the offending pebble, but made no hurry about it. With his long fingers wrapped about her ankle like a shackle, balanced on her other foot, she was well and truly caught. He glanced up at Beatrice, and there was something predatory in those eyes, She'd seen engravings of giant reptiles from Africa, monsters that laid in wait in the water, 
biding their time, and then would spring forth, snapping their jaws around unexpecting passers-by. It was all too easy for her to believe that she was in great danger of being pulled beneath the murky water just now. As if sensing her unease, the judge laid her shoe aside carelessly. His grip on her ankle tightened as she attempted to slide it from his grasp. He tutted a little, chuckling mirthlessly again. No, no, my pretty one, he said. You have led me on a merry chase these last months, and I was content to chase you. For a while. And now? Beatrice asked, swallowing hard, refusing to let her voice betray any of her nerves. Now, the judge continued, his white teeth flashing in the dark. I have caught you, and it is time for you to make good on your end of our little arrangement. I do not recall entering into any arrangement, Beatrice insisted, trying again to slide her foot away from the judge. Though he chuckled again, his fingers tightened cruelly around her ankle, the bones in her foot beginning to grind together painfully. Beatrice refused to cry out, lifting her chin defiantly. Now you know as well as I do how this sort of thing is meant to work. His dark eyebrows knitted together a little, his mouth firming into a cruel slash. I believe that you also know that I have within my power to end your career, here and now. And how will you manage that? Beatrice scoffed. As if anyone will be put off by a dancer with a questionable reputation. It's practically a requirement. Judge Horner shifted his grip so that his thumb was pressing into the soft little hollow where the front of her leg met her ankle, causing Beatrice to wince. You misunderstand me, he said. Though I have no doubt that I could make things uncomfortable for you in the manner that you suggest. I had something more... Y- direct in mind. He finished the sentence by pressing his thumb in harder. Fear, real and sickening, slid through Beatrice's stomach. She had a very visceral paranoia about losing her ability to provide for herself, losing her gateway to independence. Instinctually, she attempted to wrest her leg away from Horner again, but to no avail. Yanking her leg back down, he shifted and stood abruptly, nearly unbalancing Beatrice completely. His hand snaked about her waist, closing like vices of iron along her sides. I do admire your spirit, little minx, but it is time to stop playing coy, he said, pulling her in close against him. For all of her fear, it was anger that flashed up in Beatrice's eyes. This seemed to amuse him, for he smiled cruelly down at her again, finding her stiffening posture and incentive to keep pressing his advantage. Beatrice reasoned that it was likely that no one had ever told him no before, and her resistance was as intriguing to him as her shapely legs. He no doubt had done this little intrigue countless times before, and had grown bored with the ease with which he conquered other dancers and actresses. He had figured that for all of her control and distance, Beatrice would fold like all of the others. What he had clearly not counted on was the fact that Beatrice was no ordinary theatre girl. She was renowned for her bright, shiny spine as much as her ability to turn neatly and leap higher than the other dancers. She'd made a vow to herself when she was younger that she would never allow herself to be at the mercy of a man. The second thing that Judge Horner had not counted on was that while travelling through Italy with her former partner's dance troupe, They had crossed paths with a group of men from the Far East. Beatrice, the consummate student of human movement, had been fascinated by a series of strange exercises they did. She had also been intrigued by a particularly slight man that all of the others gave a wide berth. He had liked the way that she poured tea, and she had liked the way that he moved through the world without fear, despite his size. Right in this moment, however, She mostly liked that he had taught her the simplest and easiest means of breaking someone's nose. With her fingers curled back, revealing the firm lower edge of her palm, she struck neatly and quickly, thrusting her hand upward into the tip of Horner's nose. Her erstwhile teacher had referred to it as a tiger's paw, 
which Beatrice was quite tickled by. She was also immensely gratified by the way that the judge's head snapped back, his eyes watering as blood immediately began to pour from his nose, black and shining in the dark. He released Beatrice immediately to cradle his face. Beatrice took advantage of this to sweep up her discarded shoe and scampered a few paces away. Horner, still bleary-eyed, swung out wildly with one hand, grasping for Beatrice. He swore all the while, calling her every foul name he could think of. Really, Your Honour, I'd have thought you'd have more imagination than that, Beatrice said. I've had worse insults slung at me by altar boys. Irate, he looked up, his grey eyes burning. His shirt front and crisp white cravat were both thoroughly ruined, a surprising amount of blood pouring forth from his nose. Idly, Beatrice wondered if she might have broken it. You will regret this, he spat, attempting to staunch the flow from his nose with a hastily dug out handkerchief. I regret many things, Judge Horner, Beatrice said coolly, sounding infinitely more composed than she was currently feeling. I doubt that this will be one of them. With a proud toss of her head, she turned her back on him, shoulders confidently back. As if she were out for nothing more than a Sunday turn about the park, she sauntered leisurely away. At least, she did, until she reached the first turn in the maze. After she had ensured that she was out of his line of sight, she picked up her feet earnestly, lifting her hem a little and dashing back to the main part of the gardens. She did not stop until she was back among the crowd. In spite of her brave words, she could not believe what she had just done. She attempted her usual calm, dispassionate veneer, but she kept her hands clutched together tightly to ensure they would not visibly tremble. Chapter 4 Though the sun had not yet risen, Gregory was already awake, shaved and dressed. He was a creature of habit, and the timetable set forth by his time in the army was one he stuck to rigorously. He did not see the point in putting off the day, wishing to keep himself as busy as possible. Allowing himself the indulgence of laying about in bed was out of the question, no matter that he was not currently in active service. Besides which, he had a heavy task set out for himself today, and he preferred to dispense with it early. It would be easier, after all, to get it done whilst his three incorrigible daughters still slept. With a determined set of his jaw, he gave himself one last look in the mirror and then dismissed his valet, who silently withdrew. On booted feet, Gregory went downstairs, taking up position in the small library that he used as an office. The fire was not yet lit, and the rooms were still chilled in the grey pre-dawn. He did not mind. He was used to a degree of discomfort, preferring it to being overly pampered. He reached for the bell pool next to the fireplace, then took his place in the hard-backed leather upholstered chair behind the small but heavy desk. It was some moments before a servant answered, a sleepy hall boy of no more than twelve. The household was used to Gregory rising early, but not at being summoned at this hour. It was typically only a scullery maid and a hall boy awake now, quietly moving through the house to wake the other servants and light the fires for the morning. You rang, sir? He asked timidly, not used to addressing the colonel. Please send for Mrs. Bird at once, Gregory replied. He expected it would be some moments before the governess was roused and made herself presentable. It was wholly unexpected then that she appeared within only a few moments. It was more expected, however, that she appeared already wearing a travelling dress and police, a simple poke bonnet on her head. Mrs. Bird entered the library with her head held high, but her shoulders slumped the moment she saw the colonel's face. Good morning, sir. She said politely enough, but her voice is strained. I shall not shilly-shally about, Mrs. Bird, Gregory said in quick clipped words. I see that you have already packed, wasting no time. Good. I thought it best I leave before the girls wake, she explained. I did not see the point in lingering after yesterday's... events. Too right you are, Gregory agreed. Reaching into his desk, he withdrew an envelope that he had prepared the night before. 
I believe this is all that is owed to you, he said, handing it over. With well-mannered reluctance, the governess hesitated when reaching for her remaining wages, as mentions of anything pecuniary were always a little vulgar. Her practicality as a servant won out, however, and she eventually snapped it up, tucking it into a deep pocket. She did not move immediately, shifting about before Gregory's desk. He had already moved on, not seeing the point in drawing the whole business out with any sort of emotional farewell. Was there something else? he asked, his attention already turned to locating his pipe. It had been a trying morning already, and he was fond of a turn about the grounds before breakfast, pipe in hand, to settle his mind. He located it, then withdrew a worn tobacco pouch from one of the drawers. I wonder if I might inquire if there was any sort of reference included in your generous packet, Mrs. Bird asked, lowering her voice a little. Gregory glanced up, his brow furrowed a little as he went about the business of packing the bowl of his pipe. It was a particularly good blend, enriched with vanilla and spice, and he was perturbed at not being able to savour it. And what sort of reference should I have included? Mrs. Bird? He asked, making no such effort at modulating his voice in deference to the hour or subject. As far as I can tell, you have made no progress with my girls at all. They are just as wild, wilder even, than when you first arrived. Well, I'm not sure I would agree, Mrs. Bird objected without much conviction. Wouldn't you? Gregory shot back, clamping the stem of his pipe in his teeth and replacing the pouch in the drawer forcefully. I dare say I haven't seen any indication to the contrary. They've no manners at table, they do not paint or embroider, and the only French I've heard from them does not bear repeating. I can hardly be blamed for all of that, the governess protested. Then who precisely is to blame? Gregory asked practically. Taking up a small bit of reed, he lit it from the candlestick on his desk and used it to light his pipe. He puffed a few times, encouraging it to burn, filling the library with the warm, smoky smell. As I recall, that was precisely why you were hired. Indeed, I do believe that is the entire point of a governess. That may be so, sir, but I was not hired to tame a bunch of wild bantlings. Mrs. Bird's voice cracked a little as she spoke. As I recall, I told you from the outset that the girls were in some difficulties, having lost lost their mother, Gregory said, faltering only a little and recovering himself quickly. And you assured me, in the most unequivocal terms, that it was nothing you could not handle. He paused, pulling open another drawer and withdrawing a folded letter. In fact, you wrote when you accepted the position. I have no fear of misbehaving children, having successfully tamed more than a few in my years as a governess to Lord Henley. I shall see to it that your girls will be fit for the finest dining rooms without delay. Gregory read out, holding the letter up. Mrs. Bird blanched a little as he read, her mouth pressing into a grim line. I obviously was mistaken, she said, but I bet you have some compassion. I will never be able to take another position without a character from you. Gregory considered, leaning back as much as his straight back chair would allow. He reached up and took his pipe in one hand, taking in Mrs. Bird, then replaced it between his teeth. Very well, he said, withdrawing a sheet of paper from the centre drawer. I shall not be unkind, but neither shall I be needlessly flattering. I wish that you had only shown so much pluck when it came to my girls. Mrs. Bird made a small sound, which caused Gregory to look up at her from beneath his brow as he wrote. She did not say anything, but her meaning was clear. As far as she was concerned, there was not enough pluck in the world to bring the Hillmott children to heel. Gregory finished writing quickly, signing it with no flourish. He folded the reference over and sealed it with a wax wafer. He passed it over, Mrs. Bird taking it in both hands. She turned toward the door, then paused for a moment, looking back at Gregory as she turned the letter over in her hands. I wish you luck, Colonel, she said with a lingering look. I suspect you will need it.
Gregory said nothing to that, and Mrs. Bird was gone without another word. He waited for a few moments as she cleared the hallway, on her way back to York and to the agency from whence she had come. After the muffled sounds of her leaving had ended, silence reigned in the house once more. There was only the ticking of the grand clock in the main hall. To break the stillness and the occasional chirping of a bird that heralded the coming sunrise. It was a peaceful moment, but Gregory took no pleasure or comfort in the stillness. If he was still for too long, his thoughts would gain a foothold, and their constant companion lately was grief. Not wishing to allow himself to be idle long enough for that to happen, he tapped out his pipe, replacing it on the desk for now as it cooled. With a slap of his knees, he fairly sprang from his chair, the legs squeaking a little against the wood floor as he did so. His stride was long and confident as he left the library, crossed the large main hall, and then climbed the stairs. Once at the top, he automatically turned right, down toward the nursery where the girls all slept. He made no effort to moderate his steps, having no intention of letting his daughters laze about a bed, particularly after they had driven off yet another governess. Though he was not inclined to tolerate any impertinent comments from Mrs. Burt, he could not fully repute them. He also knew that he had his own hand to play in their poor manners. After his wife had died, he had felt unmoored, moving through life, but not really living it, and his daughters had likewise been cast adrift. The door to the nursery was slightly ajar, and, quietly, he pushed it open, fully intending to rouse his errant daughters. The scene within, however, made him pause. All was still and silent, save for quiet snuffles as the girls slept. With one hand on the door latch still, Gregory surveyed the beds. All were tucked up tightly, sleeping soundly, faces unlined with conflict or worry. At one end of the nursery, the door to the governess's alcove was open, showing an empty room on the other side. It would have to be filled, and quickly, as Gregory himself knew very, very little about what it was to properly rear girls. He had some idea of the basics, what their accomplishments should be, but beyond that, he was completely at a loss. It had never occurred to him that he would have to do so on his own, without his wife by his side. Opposite this alcove, against the other wall, as far as possible from the others, Florence's bed stood, she too was wrapped up tightly in her blankets against the cold, the fire behind the screen in the hearth having gone out through the night. The fact that she had to sleep in the nursery still was a source of constant fighting between father and daughter. She insisted that she was too old to still sleep within, and Gregory held firm that when she conducted herself like a young lady, she would be treated as such. It was a stalemate, with neither willing to yield. Despite his irritation at the trio for their conduct, and particularly for their having driven off another governess, Gregory could not bring himself to wake them just yet. Quietly, he withdrew, closing the door behind him. He sighed, retreating back down the hallway whence he had come. Mentally, he began preparing the advertisement he would put in the York papers. No doubt it would spark no small comment from the neighbourhood that the latest governess had fled like all the others, but there was nothing to be done about it. He did not know what sort of person could possibly begin to take on this task, however. Perhaps I would be better served by asking for a lion tamer, he mused grimly. Chapter 5 As a dancer, particularly as a female dancer, Beatrice was used to a certain degree of notoriety. She was not particularly welcome in the better homes, unless it was to give a private performance with her fellow dancers. Even this, however, was fairly rare since she had parted company with Josiah Galpin's troupe. The plain fact was that wives and mothers did not want her around their menfolk. All of this was perfectly acceptable to Beatrice, as the trade-off was that she could live more or less as she pleased. She worked when she needed, she slept and rose when she wished, and there were very few people who could place demands on her time. Something had shifted, however, 
It was not immediately obvious to Beatrice, but there was an odd undercurrent that seemed to underscore all of her interactions lately. Usually, she could count on a few invitations in a week, sometimes to accompany one gentleman or another to the opera or the races. Occasionally, it would be to dinner or to a party hosted by someone equally daring. These invitations had dried up in the past few days, stretching into a week and then two. Beatrice found herself spending more days and nights at home, alone in her flat, than she cared for. When she did venture out, there was a new quality to the whispers and stares that followed her. Instead of it having a kind of breathless excitement about it, she caught the ton collectively glaring at her with open derision or disgust. The audience, too, seemed to be turning on her. They applauded her, but grudgingly, as if they could not deny her talent. But they did not relish in it the way that they had previously. There were no more flowers, no more gifts delivered to her dressing room either. Perhaps strangest of all was that Beatrice had the distinct impression that someone was following her. It was as if someone was constantly just beyond her field of vision, over her shoulder. If she turned to look, there was no one out of the ordinary. But she still got the impression of a jacket tail here, a wisp of unfamiliar scent there. It left her on edge, nervy and disinclined to go out alone. When it became apparent that something was indeed wrong, Beatrice resolved to call upon the one person who would not refuse her. It was also unlikely that she would lie to her either if she knew what was going on. So it was that Beatrice resolved to pay a call on Lady Ava, the crushingly beautiful wife of Josiah Gulpin. Though they had been one-time romantic rivals, Beatrice was hoping that this was somewhat in the past, as she had no one else to really turn to. Beatrice also hoped that more than a year of married life had dulled Eva's beauty somewhat. She was disappointed on the latter point, unfortunately. When Beatrice was shown into their well-appointed, though small townhouse, Eva's beauty was undimmed, shining like the sun. If anything, she was even lovelier. Worries erased from her face and a gentle contentment found there instead. Josiah was nowhere to be seen, however, and Beatrice suspected that he had made himself scarce when he had heard who was calling. Beatrice? That is, Miss Hart? Eva asked, her brows flying up her smooth forehead. Is everything quite all right? Beatrice, having followed the maid that answered the door into a small parlour where Eva was sitting to receive any callers, took off her gloves with sharp little movements. Hello, Lady Ava, she said coolly, refusing to let Eva see how unsettled she truly was. I rather imagine that you did not expect me to be one of your callers today. I did not, Ava admitted, her velvety voice showing her honesty. Still, please come in and take a seat. May I offer you something? I would never refuse tea, Beatrice replied, settling herself into a little chair opposite Eva. Julie, Eva rang for said tea, and they waited in a strained, awkward silence as the maid went to fetch it. Beatrice looked about the parlour, the domesticity of it all, and did her best to keep her lip from curling. There was very little style, but then Beatrice was used to only allowing the most beautiful of things near her abode. I know that face, Ava said softly into the silence, startling Beatrice, who slid her eyes over to stare at her. You are disapproving of something, but working very hard to not let it be known. It's not that I disapprove, Beatrice objected hurriedly. It's more that... Well, to be honest, I had never expected Josiah to be the sort of man with doilies on his side table, if you take my meaning. It is far more domestic than I would have credited him with. Ava looked around, her eyes flicking over the furnishings as if seeing them for the first time. A slow smile crept over Eva's face. I know what you mean, she agreed to Beatrice's surprise. I would have been content to remain on a tour of the continent, but Josiah was eager to settle back in London. Well, I am glad that married life agrees with both of you. Beatrice said. She checked her tone as Eva's eyes hardened a little, 
unsure if she had been insulted. Impulsively, Beatrice reached across the table, laying a hand on Eva's in an uncharacteristically warm gesture. No, I mean it, she said emphatically. I would have been very upset to come here and have seen both of you looking miserable. I'm glad that you are both happy. It is not the life I would wish for myself, but I am. It's good to see that someone in London is happy. Ava appeared to absorb this, her dark eyes searching Beatrice's face. She continued this silent, meditative observance, even as the maid reappeared with a tea tray. Wordlessly, Eva poured for Beatrice, who took her tea without milk or sugar. When they had both been served and taken a couple of sips, Eva spoke at last. I must confess that I had wondered how our next meeting would be, she said, a cautious smile on her face. I know that things had been awkward between us, but I want you to know that I have been so very pleased to hear of all of your successes. Eva paused here, and Beatrice's sharp eyes immediately cut to her. You know something, she said, less a question than a statement. Eva hesitated. I might, she admitted. I had heard that things might be, well, a little more difficult of late. Difficult? Beatrice repeated with a strange little laugh. I suppose that might be one way of putting it. Ava put her teacup down with a soft clank against the matching saucer. She placed both of her hands in her lap and leaned forward, pitching her voice a little lower, as if afraid that they might be overheard by as yet unseen persons. Miss Hart, Beatrice, you should know that I make no judgments on how you comport yourself. What you do with yourself is your own affair, in so much as I am concerned. She paused, glancing down to idly push a teaspoon forward to be more in line with the others. However, you must know that not all of London feels the same as I do. Beatrice allowed herself a little sigh. Believe me, I am quite aware. I have been on the stage in one way or another since I was only eight years old. I have seen all of the censure the ton has to offer. That is, she amended, I thought I had. Eva nodded. It seems that you have fallen afoul of someone in particular who has taken up a grudge against you. She looked at Beatrice expectantly, clearly believing that she would fill in that gap willingly. Beatrice, cagey as a cat, did not answer immediately, however. Instead, she lifted her teacup and sipped again, humming appreciatively. She was immensely fond of tea, and the blend Ava had on offer was tolerably good. She did not anticipate Ava's patience, unfortunately, and found that her hostess merely continued to gaze at her, blinking her large brown eyes impassively. I may have some idea of who is behind all of this, Beatrice relented finally. It is entirely possible that it is all down to one man in particular, actually. Eva, lifting her own teacup, raised one eyebrow queryingly. It seems like an awful lot of vitriol for a... What? A lover's quarrel of some sort? Well, Beatrice hedged, it may not be just a quarrel. It may be that I... Well, I may have put a man's nose quite out of joint, you might say. Blankly, Eva stared at Beatrice, her eyes searching her face. You've offended someone? Well... That may not be the wisest course of action, but... No, that's not... Well, yes, I suppose I did offend him, but... No, the point is that I may have ended our quarrel by breaking his nose, Beatrice announced with forced casualness, as if it were of no more consequence than discussing the latest gloves from Paris. Eva's eyes widened. Oh, Beatrice, you didn't, she breathed. Who was this man? His honour, Judge Derek Horner, Beatrice announced, saying it far more bravely than she felt after the fact. Oh, good lord, Eva gasped, pressing her fingers to her mouth. Viscount Bartholomew's great nephew? At Beatrice's nod, Eva only looked more distressed, her eyes dancing back and forth across the table. Suddenly, she rang a small brass bell on the side table, summoning the maid again. Beatrice's stomach fell, 
certain that she was on the verge of being asked to leave. To her immense relief when the maid entered, Eva said, Go at once and tell Cook to send up any cake that we might have at the ready. If we haven't one, I want you to fly like the wind down to the bakery and get the first one you see. Don't, dawdle. The maid, so thrown off by such a sudden request, sort of trotted in place for a moment before whirling for the door quickly. She stopped, remembering that she had forgotten to curtsy, and then scampered out the door. At Beatrice's bewildered look, Eva shrugged. This is a crisis far too big for just tea, she explained. This clearly requires cake, and a great deal of it, I expect. In spite of her trepidation, Beatrice couldn't help but bark out a laugh, which made Eva smile in return. Several moments were spent in companionable silence then, with Beatrice surreptitiously glancing about the room, still a little baffled that the worldly Mr Galpin could have settled into such a domestic setting. The maid returned shortly, her nose red from the cold and looking a little winded. There was a selection of little queen cakes arranged on a tray, and some other dainty cakes with icing and candied rose petals on top. After they had both eaten several bites, Ava fixed Beatrice with her dark eyes again. What is your plan now? Ava asked into the space between bites of cake. Plan? For what? Precisely, Beatrice asked, her brows raising a little. I imagine you will need to make a plan to either weather this storm or to make amends, Ava explained, pressing her fork onto some crumbs of cake. I would presume that an apology of some sort would go a long way. Plus, Beatrice interjected, sneering a little and popping one of the candied rose petals into her mouth. But I am not sure that such a thing is possible now, for a variety of reasons, Ava finished. I'd rather eat my hat than apologise to that cretin, and it's a very good hat. I've been through scandal before, I am sure that I shall court it again before I am done, Beatrice said with forced casualness. I'm not sure any of us has been through anything like this before, Eva argued gently. The very fact that you are here, taking tea with me, ought to be proof positive of that. Beatrice paused, caught by Ava's logic. She was right, of course, which only made the pit in Beatrice's stomach grow a little more jagged. Ever catching the stricken look on Beatrice's face, impulsively reached across the table and took her hand. You must be careful, Beatrice, she said, her voice lowered. I mean it. Judge Horner is notorious for his temper and cruelty, both in and out of the courtroom. It's unlikely he is simply going to let this go, particularly if you have humiliated him. He could very easily ruin you. Beatrice glanced away, her jaw tightening. It was hard to ignore what Eva said, mostly because Beatrice knew it to be very true. She had known that Judge Horner had a reputation, but had believed, foolishly, that she could keep him in hand. She'd never had trouble dandling the male of the species before, and it was entirely possible that this had caused her to grow arrogant. Not that she would ever admit that out loud, of course. Perhaps if you were to leave London for a while, Ava suggested, Not forever, but just long enough for the scandal to die down. Or, she said with uh, her thickly fringed eyes crinkling at the corners, at least until a better one comes along. Perhaps, Beatrice agreed, it is rather hard to secure invitations when one has been labelled persona non grata. There was a lull in the conversation as she idly swirled her tea gently in her cup. But then... I do not know where I would go. It's not as if I have any real connections outside of London. Have you no family to go to? Ava inquired. Beatrice wrinkled her nose. Oh, heavens, no. What about any acquaintances on the continent? Though you may not wish to depart, one hears such troubling tidings from France, Eva mused, a neat line forming on her forehead as she did so. I thought all of that business with Napoleon was settled, Beatrice replied. She had more than passing interest in politics, finding that gentlemen frequently liked to discuss it. Ava offered a little shrug. It seems perhaps not. Well, 
In any case, I have no interest in leaving England. I want to be able to return to London fairly quickly when the time is right, Beatrice said decidedly. The trouble is, I do not know where that is. It's not as if I can holiday to Bath, not if I want to completely avoid the ton. Eva nodded in agreement. That seems wise. If you are among them, it keeps the rumours alive. She paused again, lifted her cup, then put it back down. Give me some... some time to make inquiries. I might know someone who could help. Chapter 6 Idle time, or long hours in which one had nothing to occupy oneself, was a phenomenon which Beatrice had never experienced before. Boredom was an entirely foreign concept. From the moment that she was old enough to occupy herself in some fashion, she had done so. This complete stillness, with no discernible destination, was intolerable. But Beatrice was determined to keep herself from the ton, the public at large, really. If they did not appreciate her charms, they did not deserve them as far as she was concerned. She could not be rejected if she rejected them first. She had to perish the thought that this was a fairly moot point, as she was receiving no invitations and had been not so discreetly discouraged from appearing at the theatre. In fact, the only mention she saw of herself in the outside world was in the scandal sheets and gossip columns. Each story printed was more outrageous than the last, with just enough truth peppered in to make it sound plausible. If she dared to venture out, she could hear little snatches of whispered conversations, always just behind her back and out of sight. Ladies were inclined to fully cross the street when they saw her coming, lest they be tarnished by even this brief association. The list of her alleged sins grew by the day. She was a shameless, fallen woman, bent on seducing every man of the ton and ruining him. She was a petty thief who used her position to ascertain the best targets, and would then send a cohort of thieves to carry out burglaries. She was a French spy using her charms to wile government secrets out of any man she could get her claws into. These were simply the ones that were repeatable. There were more than a few that would have made a sailor blush with the language involved. So it was that Beatrice spent a week in isolation, venturing out rarely. It was on the second day of her solitude that she pushed all of the furniture aside in her apartment sitting room so that she might practice her stretches and a few steps, not wishing to grow stiff from inactivity. Of course, this caused an uncomfortable realisation. She did not actually own her apartment, nor any of the furniture in it. It was all due to a gentleman's patronage. He had wanted to offer Beatrice carte blanche, as it was politely known, and she had refused. He had kindly allowed her to stay, but now... So it was more of a relief than she would have liked to admit when a neat little invitation was left for her from Lady Eva. The address was unfamiliar, however, a very stylish number near the even more stylish St. James. The appointment was scheduled for the very next day, at precisely half past two in the afternoon. That caused Beatrice's eyes to widen. That was the prime hour for paying calls, when she would likely be observed. That could mean only one of two things. Either the hostess was ignorant of Beatrice's current predicament, or she was foolhardy and did not care who saw her come. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. It was far, far worse than Beatrice had feared. The hostess was not only aware of the miasma of scandal around Beatrice, she was also entirely sympathetic. The lady in question turned out to be the Duchess of Brandon, which should not have really been surprising. She was herself of somewhat murky origin and had taken to sponsoring any number of modern artists and writers. Beatrice had to suppose that she simply wanted to add herself to her collection. Beatrice found herself sitting in a large and airy drawing room with plaster moulding all along the ceiling and corners. The chairs, while straight backed in the French Louis style, were well padded and richly upholstered in green striped damask. A tea service was laid out, with more buns, cream and jam than could feed an entire family for a week. 
Across from her, Lady Eva and the Duchess both watched Beatrice with twin expressions of pity and beatific kindness. They were genteel, well-heeled ladies with soft hands and soft voices. They offered Beatrice tea and cake by turns or little cucumber sandwiches, anything at all to see to her comfort. It all made Beatrice feel a little claustrophobic. She had to work not to allow her more suspicious nature to take root as she had the distinct impression that they were all waiting for something. Whatever that something was, she could not say, but there was no doubt that there was an air of expectation in the room. Her suspicion seemed confirmed when both Eva and the Duchess took to glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. This seems like a great deal of refreshments for just the three of us, Beatrice commented nonchalantly, watching from the corner of her shoes for I to see their reaction. We shall have one other guest joining us, the Duchess replied smoothly, thoroughly unruffled. Then you will see why so many pots of jam are necessary. At last, when Beatrice did not think she could take it any more, the drawing room door opened and a third guest was admitted. This turned out to be none other than Lady Patience Chester, younger sister of the Duchess of Brandon, She was a dainty lady with gentle, dainty features, her cheeks reddened from the cold. It also seemed the exercise, for she was huffing and puffing, having not even paused to remove her gloves in the hallway. A distressed-looking maid followed behind her, wringing her hands as she waited to receive bonnet and glove. "'I do apologise for being late,' Lady Chester said in a light, breathy voice. "'You would not believe the crush of traffic around the palace just now,' Carriages stretching for miles. Hmm, the Duchess agreed. My husband has been summoned to court as well. Well, that means that we shall be able to have our little lady's tea without masculine interruption then, Lady Chester said with a soft smile as she slipped from her police. Everything about her was soft, from her face to her figure. Beatrice's eye was immediately drawn to an un- undeniable plumpness about Lady Chester's waist, though it was fashionable for young ladies to have a certain fleshiness about their arms and chins. There was only one reason for a lady's dress to swell about the belly like that. It could not be mentioned in polite company, of course, but Beatrice caught the Duchess's eye, who quirked a little half-smile in response. This seemed all the more confirmed when Lady Chester caught sight of the table, "'Is that strawberry jam?' she asked, staring at a pot of jam with all the focus of a falcon. Wordlessly, the Duchess slid it over toward the empty place setting, which Lady Chester sank gratefully into. She helped herself to a bun, which she proceeded to hastily slather with strawberry jam. It quickly became apparent, however, that the bun was merely a means of jam delivery, for it was positively drowning in the stuff. Lady Chester bit into it appreciatively, her eyes fluttering closed a little as she did so. Oh, Annabella, thank you so very much. Please tell me there is plenty more. The older sister smiled gently at the younger. I prepared especially for you, she said, nodding toward another little crystal bowl of the ruby red stuff. All of this familiarity and personal affection was chafing against Beatrice. It was not that she was without feeling, but she had never been particularly close to anyone, preferring her independence. Now, to see all of this familiarity, the way they all glanced at one another, speaking without speaking, a touch here, a laugh there, made Beatrice feel like an intruder at a family soiree. Why am I here? She blurted into the midst of the conversation. All three across the table turned to blink at her in surprise. They were like a gradient of some sort. All the way to the left, Lady Chester, her copper blonde hair curling becomingly over her ears, her skin pale as milk with peachy cheeks. The Duchess of Brandon in the middle, her hair darker blonde, shading to bronze, twisted up in an embroidered ribbon, her dark green eyes placid and watchful, and Lady Eva, dark eyes beneath darker brows. Obsidian hair held loosely atop her head, her mouth like two perfectly formed flower petals. It was enough to make Beatrice feel outnumbered, which naturally put her back up a little. Well, 
Eva said, glancing once to the others. It occurred to me that we might need more help than you and I could muster on our own. So, so naturally, she came to me, and I went to Annabella, Patience interrupted, smiling warmly at her sister. Naturally, we would like to help. But why? Beatrice asked, her brows knitting together. None of you are my relation. We're not... She paused, speaking haltingly. We have not got the best history between us. To her surprise, Lady Ava chuckled huskily. That is true of all of us here, she said with a wry grin. We've all been romantic rivals or otherwise at loggerheads. I'm sure darling Kitty would have loved to be part of this circle as well, but she's still off on her honeymoon. But, but why? Beatrice pressed. We owe nothing to each other. You are not beholden to me. No, but who else will have a look out for us? Whom else might we call upon in our time of need, if not for our fellow woman? The Duchess asked simply. We have all known struggle and hardship, and I dare say there is not a one of us here who would not have been glad of a sisterhood to call upon. Lady Chester and Lady Eva both nodded, their expressions introspective. Beatrice looked at them, her eyes narrowed a little as if she could not discern if they were in earnest or having a jape at her expense. Are you not worried about what will happen to you if you are seen in my company? What about your reputations? Reputation was a weighty word for women. Their entire worth was tied up in that word and not only their prospects, but that of their own daughters as well. It was a fickle thing, lost easily and impossible to fully recover. Being seen out in public without a bonnet was enough to cause tongues to start wagging, let alone to be seen conspiring with someone of Beatrice's ilk. The Duchess was the first to break the silence that word had brought crashing down. I think we've all had to break free of the tongue in one way or another. I am the eccentric duchess, the seamstress who climbed out of the gutter to put a coronet on her head. I don't think anyone would be particularly surprised that I have taken in yet another wayward artiste. My husband is a dandy, and I collect theatre troops like some ladies collect fans, Lady Chester added. I'm already tainted by that particular hobby. Lady Ava nodded. I married a dancer and became one myself. As far as the ton is concerned, I have fallen nearly as far as a young lady might. Which brings us to the first step of the plan, the Duchess continued. The first is to remind the ton that you have powerful friends. Yes, you still do, and that we still wish to count you among our acquaintances. We will not flinch, and the ton will follow suit, eventually. Or so you hope, Beatrice murmured. That is true, we do hope, her grace continued. The second part of the plan is to spirit you away from London. I understand that it may be necessary for you to take on employment in the meantime. That is so, Beatrice agreed, feeling her shoulders sag a little. I suppose I am to be sent off to be a dance teacher in some far-flung wilderness then. The three other ladies exchanged glances. Not precisely, Lady Ava said vaguely, though that may be a part of your duties. My mother, the dowager, has heard tell of a very respectable man, a colonel, who requires a governess for his three wayward daughters. They have apparently proven too much for any other hand set to the task, and he is more than a little desperate as so, the Duchess said. A governess? Beatrice gasped, her mouth agape. She looked between them, certain now that they were having her on. You cannot be serious. Why not? Lady Eva asked. You already have experience teaching young ladies to dance. It cannot be much more than that. But, but what could I possibly teach them besides? Beatrice demanded. She stood quickly and began pacing a little, agitated. What use have I for needlepoint or sock darning? The Duchess levelled a stare at Beatrice. I should like to think that you would be able to teach them something a little more useful than that. Besides which, 
Lady Chester interjected, helping herself to another helping of jam with a bun. It sounds as if this colonel cannot afford to be particularly particular. Lady Eva nodded. We will make sure that you are provided with a perfectly respectable reference, with no allusion to your previous... Uh, occupation. Beatrice's pacing slowed as she considered. It would be a very, very different life from what she was used to, and the whole concept of having complete charge of children was more than a little frightening to her. She'd never considered herself particularly maternal, and did not have the foggiest idea of what she might be able to do for these girls. Where is this alleged colonel to be found? She asked at length. Another round of glances met that question. North, some miles outside of York, the Duchess answered with some evident trepidation. Clearly, seeing Beatrice's feelings on that subject evident on her face, the Duchess raised a placating hand. Now, please consider the merits. No one is likely to know your name that far from London, let alone your face. Even if they read the scandal sheets, which I doubt anyone up there does, they will not make the connection. You could become someone entirely new up there, Lady Eva said, her eyes searching Beatrice's face. And you could have a rest from all of them, Lady Chester added, her pert little nose wrinkling as she gestured broadly to indicate the ton. Beatrice considered, trying not to dismiss the proposal out of hand. They all made cogent points, but part of still demanded, York? The idea of being stranded in some northern wilderness was not high on her list of things she wished to do, and yet there was merit to this. She did not know how long she might have to spend in her apartment at the rate things were going. She stopped pacing, gripping the back of her chair with both hands. What would I even wear? It's not as if I have a governess's wardrobe she pointed out, gesturing at her rather fabulous magenta pink silk hat, complete with curled feathers. The Duchess smiled broadly, her dark green eyes sparkling. Clearly, she took this inquiry as acceptance, however reluctant. We've thought of that too. That did not particularly comfort Beatrice. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.